Let's open in prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to have his way. We're going to worship the King. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you for your faithfulness, God. Lord, we pray for the anointing on your word, on the worship, on all that we do. Father, we come to lift your name up. Lord, that your name be glorified in us, in our lives, in our actions, in our words. Have your way in this place, Father. We surrender everything to you, O oh God. We give you this service in Jesus' mighty name, and we all sin. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Greatest day in history. Day to speak, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave. Life return, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive.
morning, everyone. Good morning, Facebook. I know you slept really very well last night and you're energized and, and, and enthusiastic. I know that's not a word, it's made up. Wherever you are, just have fun with the Lord this morning.
thank you, Father, so much for your goodness, for your grace, for your love, for your mercy. We worship you. Father, we ask you to bless the givers and the gift. 
in Jesus' name. Lord, whether those are giving here or those are giving online, you know the needs of the house. And Lord, um, it's not so much about the money, God, it's as much as it is about missing the church family. So God, we pray that you will uh, get us through this to the other side quickly. Lord, as I know, Father, for most, it's we're at the end of the uh, quarantines, but many are still weak. Lord, we lift up the Lee family, God, and Shelly, Lord, as uh, she's home from the hospital to strengthen her body. Lord, Livy, oh God, I heard she's and a couple of the girls have been sick. God, we lift them up. Uh, thank you that Oliver and Jacob are feeling better, God. Lord, and throughout the house, God, Bridget, different ones, Lord, we just thank you that your hand is there, and that you are faithful and true. Bless the gift today, bless the giver, and Lord, you be the multiplier. Thank you, Father, so much for your faithfulness and your goodness. In Jesus' mighty name, we all sin. Amen. Well, if you're here, why can't we sing it? I guess we got one basket. Oh, we already did it? Oh, okay. Well, well I was praying. I guess we're good. Amen. Caleb's going to sing. This is a special, and I'm going to bring the word afterwards. We welcome you today. Come on, Caleb. Sing it before the Lord. Great. 
those that have stayed and have been able to maintain the house, God. And Lord, I thank you for giving Caleb the strength to lead the worship, Lord, and uh, minister through song. Father, such a beautiful anointing. We ask you, God, that you would minister your word today and that it would be alive in our spirit. God, that you would stir it up in us, Lord, and in me. And let your name be glorified. I give you praise. And I give you honor. And I give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As uh, Sister Tammy and I have spent more time sitting and sleeping in the last two weeks than I think our entire life. Um, <clears throat> as you know... Uh, there's not a whole lot. Our television doesn't play much. Uh, we, we opted to be limited, so um, I think it uh, mostly plays Hallmark at this point. And uh, <laughs> so um, as we're sitting there in these comatose states just saying, God, get us through this day to the next. Um, she had a couple of the Hallmark shows on, and something on one of the shows really just stuck in my heart. And uh, I didn't even think about it till uh, we came here this morning. But it kind of reminds me of our situation in today's world. Some people are having a tough time. Some people are not. This is just where we're at. Uh, we've all been there. You know, since there's seasons of rejoicing for some and seasons of sorrow for others. And there was a situation in one of the shows to where a young lady got a bad report. And um, other than a miracle, she was going to die. And I remember just watching this one spot where the father says to the daughter, says, you know, how can you be so positive all the time in this situation? How can you be so positive? And it wasn't a spiritual, you know, she was spirit-filled, born-again Christian. It's hallmark. But the wording was so perfect. Because she looked at her father and she said, don't be afraid. And he said, how can you be so positive all the time? And she says, what other choice do I have? I love the answer. What other choice is there? You know, I'm just going to give up? Is that, is that, you know, no. My only option is to be positive Amen. and trust that it's going to be all right. Amen. And... That's from a Hallmark perspective, but from a Christian perspective, that's, that's how we survive. That's our livelihood. That's what we do. We walk through this. And if, if we go through a situation that is difficult, we know because God is faithful that we'll make it to the other side. We know the scripture says no weapon formed against us can prosper. That's the heritage of the saints. That's the guaranteed promise. When all else fails, Christians, they just grab a hold and say, God, okay, you got this. We're going to go through this thing. And some of us have gone all the way through to the other side and got to be with him for eternity. Mm -hmm. Others have survived and gone on and life's gone. He is faithful no matter what. No matter what we endure, he is God. So I began to think um, earlier this morning as I was praying, I just want to bring you a couple of scriptures. So we're going to go to 1 Peter. I'm just going to share briefly this morning. I'm not 100%, but uh, I'm thanking the Lord I'm able to be here and, and uh, function. Amen. But I want to go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Just bear with me, please. 1 Peter chapter 1. Starting with verse 6. is wherein you greatly rejoice... Though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. In other words, he's saying, you know, rejoice, this is a season, and maybe you're going through the hard side right now. Maybe you're not. It's all right. And I'm going to say this. If you're not going through a tough time right now, you don't have to feel guilty because it's going all right. Because there's been some times it wasn't going all right and someone else was having a good time. It's just the way it is. But it says... The trying of your faith, the trying of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 
And the beauty of this thing is that gold, if, if, and I haven't done it in a long time. I've forgotten more than I can remember, but basically the heating of the gold would get rid of all the impurities of it so that it's perfect in its form. It's, it's pure completely with no more of the ingredients that would taint it at all. The heat forces that stuff out. The fire causes all the impurities to leave. And in a strange way, that's what God is saying, is when we go through these seasons of trials, it purifies our faith that we walk at a level that is beyond what we've ever walked before. And it's true. And sometimes people can look at it and say, well, uh, no, it looks like weakness in you. And sometimes that which looks like the most weakest time in your life is really the strongest time of faith in your life. Because it's the faith that's been purified by trial and by fire and by circumstances. I want to jump over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. I'm going to get straight to the word here uh, as far as storyline in just a moment. But the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and most of you are very familiar with this, that this is the faith chapter. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. For by it, and I love verse 2, I just love it, because it says, by it, the elders obtained, they, they grabbed a hold of a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Verse 5 says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he would not see death. It was not found anymore. Verse 6, but without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And you go on to read the rest of by faith, by faith, by faith. All these did what they did by faith. They stood in faith. In Romans 1, verse 16 and 17, it says the just will live by faith. Now, we understand that we are saved by faith. We, we accept him, and we uh, are forgiven by faith. And we know that God does this beautiful work inside of us and washes us by the purifying of his hand. But it is by faith. And faith, though, takes on different dimensions. And I wrote down uh, three things. Number one, the decision of faith. Number two, the action of faith. And number three, the result of faith. The decision of faith, the action of faith, and the result of faith. And this is where it kind of started coming together in my brain this morning as I was talking to the Lord and meditating and just trying to get a good focus on what it was to bring. And the decision of faith is something else. You know, talk is cheap until it is tested. <laughs> we, can, we can talk it all day long. We really can. We can talk about it, we can share about it, we can you know, discuss it, we can have group discussions about it, we can even preach about it. Uh, and that is the, the place of the decision to trust God. And I'm, I'm stepping beyond just the saving faith because, you know, we're saved by faith, we believe in our heart, we confess with our mouth, we accept Him, and our sins are washed away with a beautiful gift that is from God. But then comes the journey of life and the testings and the tryings and the, the circumstances where we can, we can declare our faith in God. But then there comes that moment to where it is tested and tried completely. And it's in that moment sometimes that we feel like our faith is weak. It's in those moments that sometimes people look at us and think our faith might be weak. Don't ever be that one to look at someone and the circumstances of their life and begin to judge them and say, well, they must be doing something wrong. Because that's not always the case. It can be the case. But most times, it's just the circumstances of life that we are walking straight through. And so God is faithful. So we learn how to say, God, right in the midst of everything, 
The good, the bad, and the ugly, I will praise you. If it's the best days of my life, I will praise you because I know you're the one that gave them to me. If it's the worst days of my life, I will praise you because you're going to carry me through to the other side. And so that's a part of this journey. But we've got to make the decision beyond just the salvation to say, God, okay, I trust you with my life, period. And unfortunately, as I've been... Uh, serving the Lord these many years and uh, have seen so many people come to an altar of repentance. Please forgive me. This is going to sting just a little bit. Sometimes the altar of repentance is really just an altar of bailout. The altar of repentance becomes just an altar of bailout. Bail me out of the mess I've made of my life. Now, I'm not saying that's every case. Don't think I am. But sometimes and many times it is. And so people are excited because they've gone to God, they've gone to an altar, they've cried, people have held them, people have prayed with them a prayer of faith, they've given their heart to the Lord, and the next thing you know, life comes full circle, and they're facing trials and situations, and that's the testing of the prayer. The circumstances that we face become the testing of, was that prayer for real? And so if it's not just a bailout, if it's not just God fix the mess, but if it is I surrender all to you, Lord Jesus, be my Lord and my Savior, then when the trials of life come, we can just grab a hold and say, God, you got me. Everybody understand what I'm saying? That's how this works. It's not just an emotional move where I go to an altar because it's exciting for me to be able to say a prayer and to realize that slip moment I am purified and washed in the blood of the Lamb. And I, I'm a new creature in Christ. I say, wow, I'm born again. And my life is clean. But that's just the beginning. That's the doorway of the acceptance of the work of Christ. And then he said, now, you have to trust me. You know, the early church, they, they went to the altars and they prayed. Excuse me, when they got baptized, and the next thing they knew, that decision may cost them their life. That decision, you know, this is, this is some facts. If you were a young Jewish boy back in the Bible days, and you, went, you began to follow this one of Jesus Christ and accepted him, and you came home and you told your dad, and your family said, look, I found the Messiah, the Savior, and I'm going to follow him. Here would be your greeting from your father, son. If you follow that man, I will disinherit you because he's not the Messiah. The religious system rejects him, and so do we. And sometimes for a young man or young woman, it may have cost them everything in their life to follow Jesus Christ. So it's more than my sins are forgiven. Now it's going to cost me everything. Catherine Kuhlman said, don't think for a second your salvation won't cost you because it will cost you everything if you're truly saved. But you're never going to give away more than you get back. He's always faithful to pour back into us so much more than we can ever give. I've been serving the Lord now for um, over 50 years. And I can say this without any doubt whatsoever that I have not given anywhere near what he has poured back into me. The blessings that I've received, if he never blessed me again, it's been worth it all because he's faithful. So it's in the midst of the trial that our prayers of confession are tested. It's in the midst of the trial that our faith becomes purified. And I'm going to say this. I think for most people, they feel like their faith is the most vulnerable in the worst trial of all trials. But in truth, your faith has been the most powerful in those seasons of times. Because you let go of everything and said, I'm holding on. It's the decision of faith that I think is the most powerful thing we can do as a Christian or uh, walking this Christianity out. And then the second part of that is the action of faith. And I want to just share two stories in your Bible. You're familiar with both of these. And this is in the book of Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel chapter 6. I'm not going to, to go through it. You know the stories. But in Daniel chapter 3... You have three young men that are uh, standing out in the crowd. Now, I'm just going to say this. I know they were not saying our lives are about to affect the whole world. 
They were just three young men that had been arrested by the Babylonian Empire. They were made eunuchs. And now they're in the king's house, but they've been blessed because of God's blessings on Daniel and the three of them. And they have a position of authority. And so the king sets up an idol, you know the story, and says, when the music plays, everybody must bow down and worship this idol. And these young men knew, we will not bow down to any other god. See, this, they can talk faith. We have faith in our God and his law. But now the action of faith is coming into play. Because the action of faith will lead us to pure faith. It will. The action of faith will lead us to pure faith. So here they are. They're standing there, and uh, all the people are getting ready, and they're looking at each other and saying, you know, we can't do this. Well, yes, you can. You just bow. No, we're serving God. And so when everybody bows down to worship this idol, these three young men are standing there and refusing to. And they're brought before the king, and the king says, what are you guys doing? And he says, I'm going to do this again and give you another shot. But if you don't bow down, we're going we're gonna to burn you in the fiery furnace. Man, come on. And the king kind of liked these guys, apparently. And they said, king, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. We don't know whether our God's going to deliver us today or not. But know this, we're not going to bow down. You see, that's faith in action. The moment, listen to me close, the moment they said, we don't know whether our God's going to deliver us or not. People say, see, they didn't have real faith. No, here's where the real faith came in, because we really don't know what God's going to do. From one day to the next, God does what he wants to do. We trust, we hope, we pray, but until God does it, it's all God. You with me? So they're in the position, they said this, we don't know whether our God will deliver us or not, but this we do know, we will not bow down to your gods, and he will. Deliver us out of your hands one way or another, basically. The second they said that, they went from the uh, decision of faith to the actions of the purest of faith. Because they stepped to a level of faith that got completely out of their control. You understand? They were in control. It's so easy. Just Let's just kneel down with one knee. And God knows our hearts. It won't matter. God will forgive us. We'll be fine. Those things all really do work for most people. But the one that decides, I'm going to go to the next level in my walk of faith. It's the guy that says, we don't know what's going to happen. And see, a lot of people today say, oh, see, they're doubting. Stop doubting. Don't quit all that religious fakery. Just watch and see where faith comes out. And they said, King, we're going to have to trust our God on this one. The king got so mad, his face turned, and he charged the men. He struck the fire seven times hotter. The fire got so hot that it killed the men that were causing it to stir. The mighty men of war died. And they tied the three Hebrew boys up their hands and their feet, and they threw them in the midst of the fire. Now, I want to ask you this. Where's your faith when you're falling into the midst of the fire? It's the best of the best. Because from the second your hands are tied, the second your feet are tied, your trust is 100% in God. For his outcome. Am I right? Yes. And even, even though they said, well, we don't know what our God will do. And people would say, see, there's negativity. You can't be negative. That is so silly because the next step they're taking is we don't know the future, but we know who holds it. And we surrender all of our ability to protect ourselves. We surrender every single thing we have to save our life. And they're thrown into the fire. You know the story. And the king looks over and he says, didn't we throw three men in the fire? Yes, O king, that's what happened. Then why, when I look, is there four men walking loose 
in the midst of the fire. And one doesn't look like a normal person. There's kind of this glow about one that looks like it might be a God down there with them. And they pulled them out. And the king made a decree, said their God is a real God. Then we go on to chapter 6. And, you know, the, the system of that society, the political world hated favor of God that would be on his people. And so they became jealous of a guy named Daniel. The three of these guys, best friend. And the presidents and all those that were in charge made a plan and said, look to the king. We want to make a decree that no one can pray for 30 days to any god but you. They played on his pride and the king fell into it. And about the time Daniel realized that it was now illegal to pray. Anybody ever thought about that for a moment? How could it be illegal to pray? I just saw something on the news that they arrested um, a preacher, I think, for singing some hymns in public in one of our states. You never know. But it was illegal for him to pray. So what does Daniel do? He doesn't talk faith. He doesn't call the intercessors and say, hey, let's just have a private prayer meeting and believe God to make a shift. He put his faith into action. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and he opens the doors of the window. He starts praying towards Jerusalem the way he does every single day, three times a day. And the king's men run to him and say, O king, remember the law that no man can pray? Yes, I remember the law. That Daniel, that guy that you've kind of put in charge of a lot of things, he won't stop praying. You see, the second he opened the windows and began to pray, he was declaring, God, my faith is elevating to the next level. It's all right to pray with the window shut. It's all right to pray privately. But the moment he opened the doorway and he stepped out and said, God, my life is in your hands. It may cost me, but it's all right because I'm trusting you. His faith now elevated to a higher level of faith. And they arrest him and they bring him in. And you have to wonder what is going on inside of his mind because they're speaking to him. And the next thing you know, there's a lion's den. And these are hungry lions. I mean, they would starve them so that when they threw a body in there, it would be consumed. As a matter of fact, you find in the story that when they threw the men in there, they're they didn't hit the bottom of the lion's den before they were devoured. This was a scary situation. All because Daniel said, God, I'm going to pray, but this time my prayer will be at a different level. It will be where I lose complete control of my circumstances. I lose control of my situation. There's nothing I can do to fix what I'm dealing with. So I step out and I pray. And the king says to Daniel, what are you doing? Daniel can't help it. He's got to pray. So they bring him and they throw him into the den of lions. Can you imagine? Five minutes before the lion's den, Daniel's getting ready saying, God, I don't know the outcome. I don't know whether you're going to see me to the other side or I'm going to see you. I don't know whether I'm about to be lunch, breakfast, or dinner for a bunch of hungry lions. Or if you're going to be with me in the midst of it, I have no idea. But know this, I trust you with the outcome. Did you hear me? See, there's nothing wrong with not knowing. When the church went through a phase, this is crazy, 
The church went through a phase uh, over the years. I've been in it long enough now to watch these phases and fads and all this stuff. And people say, how you feeling today? I'm doing great. And someone say, I got a little sip. Oh, don't confess that. And whenever people say, don't confess that. As if just that single confession is going to destroy all the faith you have in your life. The silliness. We trust him or we don't. Daniel stepped into the place that I cannot fix the circumstances. The outcome is in the hand of God. I relinquish all of my control. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, period. And Daniel is thrown into the midst of the lions. Can you imagine his face? And you know, God is so, so different sometimes than we think. I wonder what the lions did. Did they rush up to him and stop? I mean, I don't know what was going on. But Daniel's down there, and all of a sudden, all these hungry lions are coming at him, and they can't touch him. Were they tamed for the night? Did Daniel lay on them? Did they come and lay beside Daniel? I have no idea. But I know this, Daniel was not alone. Because God was with him. Daniel's faith was as pure as faith can be. You see, the thing that purifies faith is this. When we are completely out of control or we completely relinquish our control, we say, God, I trust you. And that's what he put in my heart today. See, you know, no matter what people are going through, when we relinquish our control, that faith is the purest. And here we are in 2020, it'll be 2021, and three Hebrew boys make a decision not to bow down to an idol. And that simple act of faith has been talked about for thousands of years by Christians from every generation, from you know, it's been 2,000 since Jesus. I don't know how many thousands it was till then, maybe 4,000 years ago. And we're still talking about their action. And the same thing with Daniel. We're still talking about the actions of Daniel's life. Because it wasn't the faith that was limited. It was the faith that released all of its control and trust in God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's the pure faith. And the results are it affects the lives of people around us. So I just want to challenge us today that uh, when you go through the midst of the battle, when you go through the midst of a storm or your faith is tested, don't be afraid to say, God, I, I'm not in control anymore. But I trust you completely with the outcome, whether I like it or not, I trust you. And that's the kind of faith that is pure faith, that's lasting faith, that will carry on to the next generation. You know, as a young man, we, uh, uh, I was raised, my mother, you know, she's not able to come right now because of uh, the viruses and all those things, and you know that. But my mother was my pastor for many years. And as a woman of God, my father held her, held her up. And her level of faith was crazy. It really was. She had us do things. One of the things she had us do is, and, and you can say, well, this, this is a, a level of faith. Is she decided she wanted to have prayer for Slidell. I think it was Tuesdays. 10 o'clock every Tuesday. And so she got permission on God's Boulevard to put a big sign, billboard sign up on God's Boulevard. This is many years ago. And so I come home and she says, we're going to go put a sign up on the boulevard. And I said, okay. I'm not doing it tomorrow. I'm not doing it the next day. We're doing it right now. So we went to God's Boulevard, climbed up a ladder, got up on top of this sign, and bolted this 
piece of plywood that said pray in unity, I think, for Slidell every Tuesday. And someone says, well, that takes a lot of faith. And that, that does. And it's pretty cool just to step out in faith. We've all stepped out in faith and done things and watched God do it. But then there's other levels of faith that she walked in where there was no other way to fix it except God was doing it. And I've shared this many times, like the time we were on the mountain in California and there were no brakes on the car. And so my mother gets out, my father gets out, says there's no brakes in the car. And so here we are with her and the children and we all get around the car, lay hands on the car and pray over it and then get in the car and drive down the mountain. That's a whole different level of faith. That's the faith that says, God, we need you to live or die, and it's all in your hands. Oh, the young lady that's driving down Highway 11 that used to come here, I'll never forget. She said, Pastor David, she says, I was driving down Highway 11, I hit a puddle of water, and the car started spinning, and I just took my hands off the wheel and said, Jesus, help. And the car pulled over and stopped. Those are the things that bring us to the next level of faith. And that level of faith is when we say, God, I take my hands off the steering wheel. I take my control off, and I trust you with my life. I trust you with my job. I trust you with my family. I trust you with my circumstances. I trust you with every situation of my life. And I can say this. Um, Sister Tammy and I have been at every level of faith I think that you can have over the years. But we've learned completely to say, God, it's out of our hands. We relinquish our control. And so I challenge the faith of the church. Don't just talk about it and make a verbal decision. But as we step into these situations and circumstances that require our faith to be examined or tested, Step into that level that says, God, if I'm going into the lion's den, I trust you. I'll either be eaten and I'll see you tonight, or I'll come out and I'll see you later. But <laughs> either way, I trust you. Or the faith that says, I'm going to the fiery furnace. So the faith that says, I'm going to go through the storm. Whatever it is. But saying, God, I'm not going to try to control this thing. But I'm going to rest in your arms. You're my God and my strength and my hope and my soul. So, Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for each one that's here, those that are online, those that, Father, as we restore and rebuild, we ask you, God, right now to let us walk in faith. Faith, Lord, that is totally surrendered and trusting in you. Lord, I know there are some circumstances that many of us do not like. But God, we trust you in the midst of it because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we thank you and we praise you and we honor you. Bless this day, God. Bless each one. Those that are online, Lord, be with them, God, and say, face circumstances, Lord, of their own lives. Those that are sick, Lord, those that are uh, in financial predicaments, God, or whatever the case may be, we hold them up. We trust you. We honor you. And we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, and we all said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise? Please remember that we are... Uh, this week, I think, is our distribution. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Monday and Tuesday. Um, I've been kind of out of the picture because of the timing of everything. But this Monday and this Tuesday, 9 to 3, nine to three we start our toy distribution um, for the uh, recipients of the Toys for Tots program. We're going to be very careful with masks and all those type of things. But if you'd like to be a part of that, please check with Susie uh, for information of where and all that stuff. Uh, and that is this Monday and Tuesday. 
Um, we're going to be back to normal services Wednesday and then all the way through. We're trying to get things back in line. We just had our first youth service back again uh, this past Tuesday. And we're trying to get things back in line and let people come out of that place of uh, uh, quarantine so that they can get back with us. And, uh, boy, we so miss our church family, put you that way. So uh, that's kind of what's going on. And um, watch Facebook for any announcements that we might put out. And uh, other than that, anything else, Sister Tammy? No? Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> we love you. And may the Lord bless you. I wouldn't say shake hands and hug somebody's neck, but I don't need to say that. So wave at somebody and give them an air high five or something. God bless you all.